Three Lives Three Worlds The Pillow Book Upper Volume Original Work by Tanki Gongzi English Translation, Hamster 428 English Editing, Rock Harlequin, Joanna Kuang Chapter 3 Early next morning, Feng Ju rubbed her temple as she found her way out of bed in Qing Yun Palace. Still not fully awake, she looked to the long purple robe in her hand and asked the little doe, What the heck is this? The little doe was having breakfast with his parents by the wisteria tree within the courtyard. Upon hearing Feng Ju, he bit on his spoon thoughtfully for a long time, and when it finally dawned on him, punched his fists together in recognition and said, That's Brother Dong Hua's coat. Ye Hua's chopsticks holding hand paused as he arched an eyebrow, When I was little I called Dong Hua uncle. The little doe started to open his mouth, but chose to close it again. With his head hung, he worked away at counting their generation gap. Feng Ju froze on the spot. She stared at the robe in her hand, then walked over to the door and checked the sign atop to see whether this was Qing Yun Palace or not. Her eyes returned to the little doe as she stuttered, How, how did this happen? Bai Qian was helping the little doe to another bowl of porridge. It was actually nothing, she assured Feng Ju. You were drunk last night so Dong Hua was being kind by bringing you back to Qing Yun Palace. But you were so drunk you wouldn't let go of his coat. Since you couldn't be wakened, he had no choice but to leave his coat here. Feng Ju gave these words some thought and said with comprehension, it was probably on his way then. Since it wasn't anything ambiguous, neither my or his reputation will be compromised. Bai Qian held her tongue and told Feng Ju in hesitation, except, you know too that Dong Hua couldn't have stayed the night at Qing Yun Palace. He already gave you his coat and there was nothing from the doe's residence that would fit him. The doe came to me to borrow some from Yehua. That sounds reasonable enough, Feng Ju nodded her head and stepped over, wanting to join them for breakfast. Bai Qian coughed and continued, I was sleeping, a bit too soundly. The doe had called out from the courtyard. You know how loud children can be. I'm afraid the entire Ziwa Palace had heard him. Feng Ju stopped in her track and turned to look at the doe. What did you call out? Only what was true, the doe replied with pursed lips. Feng Ju took a deep breath. Reenacting the scene, the doe went on, Dong Hua Gag carried Feng Ju Jijia back to Qing Yun Palace. Feng Jujiji kept pulling him back and won't let him go. Dong Hua Gag had to hold her for a long time. Oh yeah, he also took off his clothes, but he didn't bring any extra with him so I'm here to borrow some from Dad. Mom, is Dad here with you? He then spread his hands, that was exactly what I said. Feng Ju fell straight through the door. It had been more than two centuries since Feng Ju took over sovereignty from her aunt Bai Qian. Her father Bai Yi worried each day over her matrimony. He worried that with Feng Ju's age, it would be hard for her to reign the world. Thus he was adamant in finding for her a capable groom who would be able to assist her. Bai Yi had never liked Zhu Kongtian much. But because his daughter already had an invincible record in King Kaiu, as a last resort, he was forced to shift his searching eyes and look for an exemplary son-in-law from the skies above. When Bai Qian was married away, he ordered Feng Ju to accompany her to heaven for one full month. On the outside, it appeared that the bride's family was looking out for their daughter. On the other side, he asked Bai Qian to help take care of her niece's lucky star. 
That way, he thought, Feng Ju could meet a few talents and pave the way for her love fate. Feng Ju had been staying on heaven for nearly a month, yet her lucky star remained as dim as it had been. Her babysitting skill on the other hand progressed at a rapid speed. There were only three more days until she would go back to King Kaiu. Thinking she should not waste time, she took the doe out for a stroll on the pleasant 33rd sky. Next to the sumo bushes behind the entrance gathered a circle of gambling immortals. For the past few days, Ever since the little doe's shouting after the moonlight garden banquet, Feng Ju had been refraining from coming near crowds in order to avoid more scandals. But unable to keep her curiosity at bay, she nudged the doe to check it out in secret disguise. She herself hid under the cool shades of an agar wood tree. The tree under which she was enjoying the cool air was a king agar wood which had been around since the beginning of time. It was especially sturdy and verdant. As luck would have it, this was a daily resting spot of Dong Hua Dai Jun's. And as luck would have it, Dong Hua was sitting hidden in the canopy above to ponder over a Buddhist sutra. And as luck would further have it, a gentle breeze swept by bringing with it the strong fragrance of the agar wood. Feng Ju sneezed. Turning a page, Dong Hua pushed his book aside and lowered his eyes to gaze down where they fell on her body. She wasn't at all aware of his presence and continued to sit quietly waiting for the doe to return. After figuring out the situation, the doe flew back to her like a whirlwind. Jutting his elbows out from his small chubby waist, he took two deep breaths and quickly said, that was a betting sight. They're having a long-term bet on whether brother Dong Hua, ERM, uncle, ERM, grandpa, stringing together every address, whether he will marry you or Princess Zhihe to be his queen. Feng Ju held onto an agar wood bow with one hand her other hand wiping cold sweat on her forehead. Masking her anxiety, she asked with calm, You're still so young, what would you know about betting? You're right, I don't, the doe answered ruefully. But I like learning so I asked one of the fairy brothers. He didn't tell me much, he only said Princess Zhihe already has 25 bets totally crushing you who only have three bets, and that perhaps he has picked the wrong person. Then with continued ruefulness he added, I still don't really get it but I didn't want you to wait for long so I quietly slipped away. When I left, he had been asking another brother if he could move his three bets over to Princess Zhihe or not. Feng Ju stayed in silent thought for a length of time and at last took a gold pouch from her sleeve, from it were a handful of gleaming rubies. She next removed a delicately carved emerald pendant from her neck and a jade phoenix from her belt. Giving everything to the doe, she told him with utmost seriousness, go buy two hundred bets. She paused and added, my name. The doe took the jewelries and after studying them, said with suspicion, I'm still so young yet you're teaching me to cheat. If you're from King Kaiu, you must always rank first, she replied with a glance. Your cousin can't stand to rank behind someone else. This is called the aura of a sovereign. If you don't believe me, take some time to think over my words yourself. Without missing a beat, the doe retorted, I heard little uncle said you never ranked first in school. You've always been behind everyone. Sometimes you're even dead last. Feng Ju coughed in fits. This is called prioritizing. There are things we must do, and then there are things we mustn't do. Aren't your studies the same way? Don't be ridiculous. I've never ranked last in examinations, the doe pursed his lips. 
Now recalling the horrible memories, Feng Zhu shuddered. That's because you never had to learn Buddhist doctrines so you don't know how difficult it is. Is it that hard? The Dou shuddered anxiously. Then, perhaps not wanting to face the harsh truth, he added, But I always see Brother Dong Hua, ERM, Uncle, ERM, Grandpa, holding a Buddhist sutra while he goes fishing. It seems as easy as pie. Feng Ju was silent. At length she sincerely praised, What a real weirdo! The moment her words landed on the ground, a cool breeze brought with it another strong wave of agarwood fragrance. It drew from her a sneeze. She covered her nose and ran for a few steps, then turned around and told the doe, I can't stand this scent. I'll wait for you at the small flower garden. On the top canopy, Lord Liensong who brought the Kang He sword to Dong Hua because he had nothing else to do finally got to hear Feng Ju tossed out a heartfelt comment. When the cousins had left to the far distance, he fanned his fan and probed Dong Hua, what did you do to make her compliment you that way? Dong Hua closed his Buddhist scripture and said blank-faced, compliment? Is that how Cheng Yu compliments you? Scratching his nose, Lian Song replied, Oh, she always praised me for being a cad. Feng Ju knew it was going to be a bad day the moment she stepped out the doors. Zhu Kongtian was supposed to be an auspicious place, but as soon as she stepped out of Qing Yun Palace, there were two magpies circling above her head. They even let fall two fresh dollops of excrement. Of course these minor nuisances didn't affect her interest in sightseeing, but right afterward she had to witness the pack of fairies using her and Zhihi as their gambling pastime. She was losing badly on top of that. That didn't affect her mood for sightseeing either. But in an attempt to find a peaceful resting spot, she somehow also came to an agarwood forest. Her allergic itchy nose was now sneezing non-stop. This series of signs proved that today wasn't a good day for traveling. But the springtime scenery was so pretty, it'd be such a waste to go back. She finally found her way to a safe and quiet place within the small flower garden. But still wanting to test her luck, she waited for the little doe to come back with her winning bets. She thought was about time her misfortunes ended. Once more, she gathered her spirit to go on her stroll. Just then, gentle voices reached her ears through the plants ahead. Flying into her ears with the wind was a faintly discernible conversation. Lord Buddha, it seemed her crappy luck was going to continue indefinitely. Days ago she had given herself a set of rules to follow. From here on out she must carefully avoid Dong Hua at all costs. She had been vigilant thus far, yet some sort of damning fate had brought them together again even in this small garden. She told the doe, when Dai Jun asks, tell him you're here alone to catch butterflies, okay. Then she turned into a snow-white silk handkerchief and lay still on the Nanyang marble table. From behind the sal trees indeed emerged two people, Dong Hua and Lian Song. Feng Ju could still hear despite her altered form. She heard their footsteps coming closer. The two were in idle chats. Lian Song quipped, I heard you accepted Yan Chai Wu's dual invitation and will be heading to Mount Fuyu tomorrow. Zonglin also brought to me the Kang He sword to polish. But why is it that I can't see from you, the appearance of someone who is going off to war? Dong Hua casually replied, Because my heart is at peace. Lian Song let go of conversations he couldn't win and changed topics instead. Say, what exactly were you thinking when you made the 
Kang He Sword? There is a crystal block the size of the palm, and you carved onto it 10,000 facets with 5,000 holes of the exact size. Do you know how much effort I spent to maintain it? Is there some sort of hidden machinery? Dong Hua dug into his memories. There's no hidden machinery. I was merely bored. Lien Song was silent for a second. Then he laughed and told Dong Hua, even with that evil appearance, the entire world for some reason still prays you without fail. They all think you are virtuous and upright. Not one soul has come to unmask you. Zonglin couldn't have had an easy time. He paused then continued, at the mention of whom, I wonder how he managed to put up with it until now. Dong Hua mused, when you say it like this, what? I agree he didn't have it easy. Feng Ju lay flat and straight on the table. Hearing their footsteps nearing, her heart went into doubt. Why exactly did she turn into a handkerchief and lie here? How would she hide from them now? Such a white handkerchief lying on such a white marble table, she'd catch someone's attention for sure. The doe bowed to his elders and cleverly called Dai Jun Grandpa followed by 3RD Grandpa to Lien Song. Lien Song hadn't seen his grandnephew in a while so he stroked his hair and asked after his studies. The doe answered each question steadily. By the time he lifted his head, he saw Feng Ju the handkerchief in Dong Hua's hand, with the latter studying her in scrutiny. Lien Song also turned his head and asked, This is... Dong Hua said deadpan, I lost a handkerchief. I've been looking for it the past few days. The doe widened his eyes in disbelief. He wanted to refute but he closed his mouth as he remembered Feng Ju's words. When he saw Dong Hua folding his cousin Feng Ju up, his small face crumbled in pain as he brokenly said, Be, be gentle please. Feng. I mean, the handkerchief might get hurt. Lien Song doubtingly pointed his fan at Dong Hua's hand and said, But isn't this style what the ladies use, why are you? Dong Hua with utter serenity folded the handkerchief into his sleeve. I heard I was a weirdo. What's so strange about a weirdo using a lady's handkerchief? The cloth shook fiercely within his sleeve. Surprised. Lien Song walked over to take a look and came back to his seat. Nothing, haha, nothing strange at all. Feng Ju felt absolutely frustrated being stuffed inside Dong Hua's sleeve. If she could turn back time, she would have thought more carefully and turn herself into a tree. Even if Dong Hua could see through her magic, he wouldn't be able to uproot her and bring her home. Things had gotten this far. Unless she didn't mind losing King Kaihu's face in front of him and turn back into her queenly self, it would be hard to escape from him. Unfortunately, he had realized who she was and was purposely making things difficult for her. If she was an ordinary person, she wouldn't mind losing her face over something like this. She was used to it anyway but she was presently the queen of King Kaiu. If such dishonor were to reach her father's ears, she'd get a good beating. She couldn't, under any circumstances, admit that she was Feng Ju of King Kaiu. This handkerchief wasn't worth much. He might just lose interest soon and throw her away. She started to relax. Blinking her eyes, she saw that she had arrived at Dong Hua's palace. In what was likely the back courtyard, the wall was covered underneath sprawling bodhi tendrils and branches. Glossy dark green leaves hung like a screen while willowy jade vines swayed slightly. At this time, by the arching doorway appeared a figure dressed in white. 
In fact, it was High Deity Jian from the Ten Mile Peach Orchard who never showed much interest in worldly affairs. On his back was the dough. Feng Ju turned to look in surprise, and immediately formed a newfound admiration for the dough. How smart he was to have invited Jian instead of his mother. She was going to throw away their family ties but now she was completely touched. Jian exchanged pleasantries for a while, threw out a few compliments for Dong Hua's garden, and showed admiration for Dong Hua's incense burner workmanship before being tugged fiercely by a tiptoeing doe. He slowly moved topics to the subject matter of rescuing Feng Ju and started to say, Truth be told, I've come to disturb you today because of a trivial matter. He brought the dough out from behind and continued, While I was taking a nap, this little monkey took the handkerchief I especially brought for his mother out to play. He came back with a sad face. And after asking, I understand that he had not lost it, but it was rather picked up by you. He paused and feigned a sigh. It wouldn't be such a big deal if it was just an ordinary handkerchief. However, this one was especially embroidered by the kid's grandmother for his mother. I was entrusted to bring it here on my trip to heaven. Because it has sentimental value, I can't help but come to ask for it. Feng Ju was originally worried that Jian wouldn't match up as Dong Hua's opponent. If he had opened his mouth and asked, Have you seen an embroidered handkerchief? Dong Hua would blatantly say, No, not at all. But Jian's words had clearly blocked Dong Hua's track. Jian had commanded all of Feng Ju's respect at this point. She happily lay inside Dong Hua's sleeve and waited for him to hand her over to Jian. His long slender fingers indeed reached inside his sleeve, but she had underestimated Dong Hua's level of shamelessness. Passing by her, his finger produced an exact replica that was also neatly folded. He handed it over to Jian. I picked up this one just now on the 33rd heaven. Is it yours, he said as he spooned more incense into the burner. He added, if it's not, you should visit Lord Lian Song's UNG Palace. Perhaps he picked it up. Jian looked at the handkerchief which was clearly not the right one. He couldn't say yes but neither could he say no. He couldn't believe he didn't win this battle after millennia of being a god. At this exact time, the doe sneezed. Jian conveniently grabbed the handkerchief with great sentimental value and wiped the kid's runny nose. It's only a handkerchief. Why would I worry that you'll lie to me and steal it? He smiled reluctantly. You would never do something so contemptible. Of course this one is good. He said a few more things and took the doe away. Feng Ju stared at the vanishing backs in disappointment. Because her eyes and ears were comparable to Qin Li Yan and Shun Feng Er, she could still hear the Doe crossly say, I can't believe you failed. You didn't do your best to save cousin Feng Ju. I don't know you anymore. Jian jokingly replied, It's not as if he kidnapped your little uncle, why should I make enemies with him? Furthermore, I looked at Feng Ju's fate just last year. It seems her good fortune is rising. She always dies and revives herself. This might be one of those times. Then he mumbled, but I haven't predicted people's fate in quite a while. I'm not sure how accurate it is. After a pause, he added, Right, little Ali. I also looked at your fate. Have you fallen into a love snare recently? The little doe pondered and asked, What's a love snare? Feng Ju mentally bit her fingernails and thought to herself it'd be better to believe herself than to believe Jian's divination. 
No matter if one was a god or a human, one could only depend on oneself in times of trouble. In the courtyard enveloped by the scent of white sandalwood, Dong Hua leaned over and brushed the snow-like ashes with a spoke to put out the embers. Then after a few more brushes, he covered the burner and suddenly said, How long do you intend to pretend? Feng Ju flinched. So he already knew. Fortunately she had just thought of a good battle plan, part of which was being taciturn. Thus she stayed quiet and ignored him. Dong Hua casually rested his incense spoke down. He brought her out toward the sunlight, and after a long while, unhurriedly said, So turning into a handkerchief is your hobby. What a ridiculous conclusion, yet she refused to answer him, still. Dong Hua rarely smiled, but there now appeared a quick flash in his eyes. Seeing it, Feng Ju suddenly became nervous. Sure enough she heard him say, that's good then. I'm actually in need of a wiping rag for my sword. Thanks ahead for your offer. Wipe his sword? Wipe one of the ten best weapons in the world, the same one that cut through steel like it was cutting through mud, that famous Kang He sword? Feng Ju suddenly felt faint. She was so horrified she lost her one chance at replying him. Without missing a beat, Dong Hua placed her back into his sleeve once more. At first, Feng Ju thought he would eventually grow bored and let her go. Waiting was the most pliable solution that would allow her to keep her dignity. She hadn't expected Dong Hua would make her into a sword-wiping rag and he was just the type to do what he says. The world was peaceful in recent years, there was scarcely any war that she knew of. Even with his professed intention, she wasn't very worried. Then before falling asleep, she suddenly remembered he had accepted the dual invitation from the demon lord Yan Chai Wu. The Kang He sword was bound to be blood-stained again tomorrow. She flew up in shudders and fluttered above the rosewood bed. After deliberating for half an incense time, she decided she must flee tonight. To avoid stirring Dong Hua from his sleep, Feng Ju took care not to change back into her human form. But it was nigh impossible to lift the long curtains which draped down to the ground in her current state. As she bent down, she saw Dong Hua with his silver hair flowing over the jade pillow, a thin quilt draping over his waist. His face remained ever handsome despite how many years it had been. Most importantly, he seemed to be in deep sleep. Besides clearing her five senses, she couldn't conjure up any spells to aid her escape in the shape of a handkerchief. She shouldn't say there wasn't a way. For instance, she could always turn back into her original form and at the same time cast a sleeping spell on Dong Hua. But to do so without him knowing wasn't exactly easy, and what should she do if she failed? She thought for a while. Her courage suddenly doubled in the long silent night. Sure, it'd be nice to preserve her grace, but that was as good as lost by now. Even if gossips were to spread, the worst thing that could happen would be getting a good whipping from her father. It wasn't as though she had never been spanked. Who knows, having a taste of her childhood again might not be so bad. She spun around and in a flash shape shifted back into a maiden in mourning clothes. Her fingertip softly touched Dong Hua's forehead. He made no movement. She looked at her hand in awe. Had she really succeeded? There was indeed truth in these mortal words, had rather be bold and die from gourmandizing than be a coward and perish in starvation. The air was still cool in May. Taichin Palace had also always been full of frostiness. 
Feng Zhu lifted the bed curtain, turned to take one last look at a sleeping Dong Hua, and with kindness tucked his arms back under the cloud quilt. Then with some afterthought, she pulled the cover up from his waist to his neck and carefully tucked it in. By the time she stood up, her long black hair for some reason had tangled with his silvery strands. No matter how hard she tried they refused to come apart. She didn't know how long her spell would last, so she conjured up a pair of scissors and decidedly snipped off her own locks. Then she sprang up quickly without bothering to trim it again. But because she had been a handkerchief for so long, her body couldn't find its balance and fell forward into a crooked screen resulting in a loud crashing sound. Dong Hua still didn't wake up. When she got to the doors she suddenly backed two steps in recollection of something. Facing the curtain's direction, she cast several consecutive sleeping spells. She only turned to close the doors once she saw the purple mist spread over the royal blue draperies and that the Jixiang plant at the foot of the bed had shown signs of weariness. She safely shut the doors, followed the turning corridors, and turned into the small garden where Dong Hua spent most of his daily time. Now standing within the garden, Feng Zhu lightly flapped her sleeve. Out came a night pearl as large as an orange. With its radiating light, she immediately searched for the frosty grass bush. If not for all the misunderstandings which brought her into Taichan Palace tonight, she would almost have forgotten about her precious frosty grass. Its roots were a great antidepressant, its petals were a first-grade seasoning. Siming had brought it back for her one year when he went to meet the Buddha in the far west. He even said this seed from Ling Shan was the last in the world. Too bad she had already done a transaction with the demon clan at that time. Being Dong Hua's pet fox, she had nowhere to hide the seed. All she could do was plant it in his garden. But before the frosty grass could flower, she had cut off her ties with Dong Hua and left Zhu Kongtian. It was a pity she had forgotten to bring it with her due to her pains. Feeling regrets, she now hasted here to take it back. After a long search, she at last found it inside a small flower bed, looking rather unremarkable next to the twin lotus branch beside it. She dug it up while taking care not to hurt the root cluster, then carefully wrapped the treasure in her sleeve. She now took a good look around the garden. In those days when she was still a maid, Princess Zhihi had forbidden her from encroaching the perimeter. Back then she never had a chance to enter this royal garden where Dong Hua frequented. Then when she became a baby fox, she could follow in with Dong Hua every single day and bounce around as she wished. Alas, the world which appeared before a fox's eyes was different from the world which was seen through a human's eyes. The world in those days was also different from the world at present. Feng Zhu squinted her eyes and swept across the small garden. It was a unique garden despite its small size. On the other side was a tall waterfall which separated the two courtyards. On the tiled walls were climbing Bodhi vines. They didn't look any different from other flowers during the day but at night they radiated a weak glow. They were in the shape of a small lantern and they looked exceptionally beautiful. No wonder they were also called by an appropriately elegant name, Night's Moonlight. In the middle of the garden was a tall maple tree that pierced straight through the clouds. Next to the seating area was a small lotus pond. Hanging above it was a hexagonal gazebo made from white sandalwood boughs. She sighed. It'd been many years, Yet this place hadn't changed at all. And unfortunately, memories here were starting to come back in waves. 
Feng Ju wasn't typically sentimental. There had been times in the beginning when she had drunk in pining for Dong Hua, but after she severed her ties with him she hadn't done so anymore. Her memories of Dong Hua had also faded away significantly. Yet, perhaps because she was now in a place that held deep emotional memories, and the sky above was even dotting a few lonely specks, the scenery inevitably triggered nostalgia from the past. Absorbed in thoughts, Feng Ju stared at the white sandalwood tree and the crystal table set inside the pavilion. She startlingly found that while she struggled to memorize Buddhist scriptures, her memory of a long-gone past was surprisingly clear. So vivid, they seemed as though they were passing right before her eyes. In those days when Feng Ju followed Dong Hua around after they left the wicked lotus sphere, there actually wasn't yet a hexagonal pavilion in this garden. It was the height of summer, her foxy fur had made her feel insanely stifling. She would sit inside a small boat on the lotus pond and attach two lotus leaves on her head to keep cool. Seeing her pitiable state, a few days later Deng Hua chopped down two white sandalwood trees to erect a pavilion on the water. On the floor, he installed a cool panel of glass to keep her cool. It was amazingly comfortable to lie sprawled on her back, and she had felt Deng Hua was unbelievably handy. Later on, she found out Deng Hua had been even handier than that. The incense used in Taichan Palace was made with his own hands, the tea they drank was also hand-grown, even the cups and wares were hand-crafted, and the wall screens in the palace were also hand-painted. She quietly weighed everything in her mind. On one hand, she was proud of herself for her excellent perception. On the other hand, she thought if she were to marry him, they would save quite a lot of expenditures. The more she assessed, the happier she became, and the more she liked Dong Hua. Her adoration blinded her into thinking Dong Hua was perfect. Whenever he made something new, she was the first to show her approval and admiration. Eventually as a habit, Dong Hua brought first to the little fox whatever he made for her opinion. Because time was abundant, everything he made was unsurprisingly impeccable. Sometimes, Feng Ju thought it had always been this way throughout the long years, and Dong Hua had perhaps been very lonely. It was an exceptionally ordinary day that day. She was lying stomach up at the pavilion, wondering what she could do to win over Dong Hua. The more she gazed at the stars, the hungrier she became. The hungrier she became, the sadder she got. The stars above her suddenly vanished. Dong Hua with a white porcelain plate sat down in front of her. On the plate was a syrupy glob of sweet and sour fish. The aroma wafted in the air. Dong Hua put the dish down and cast a glance at her. For some reason there was hesitation in his voice. I've just made this. Hot off the stove. She was previously bothered that she and Dong Hua weren't compatible because she didn't know any of the things he knew. But surprisingly, he was also a great foodie like she herself. Finally she had found a similarity between the two masters. She was so touched she jumped onto his knees. Then she leapt to the crystal table and used her paw to dip into the sauce at first. But remembering she wasn't human anymore, she retracted her foot and shyly licked the fish with her tongue. She froze the second she tasted the sauce. Dong Hua propped his cheek on his hand and attentively looked at her. How is it? She retreated her tongue. With that same position, she wanted to say it was really, extremely, tremendously awful. But she suddenly remembered a story her aunt imparted to her from long ago. 
It told of a young bride who wasn't good at cooking. Then one day she was in the mood to make dinner. Her groom ate everything on the table and told her it was delicious. When the wife cleaned up, she had a taste and realized her husband had lied to keep her happy. From then on they lived blissfully together, leaving behind a lovely tale for generations to come. Feng Ju closed her eyes and gritted her teeth. She cleaned the plate in less than half an incense's time. She miserably held onto her tummy and turned around to give Dong Hua a pleasing bright smile, showing him that it was delicious yet hoping at the same time he would pick up the reluctance in her smile and taste the sauce himself. Sure enough, Dong Hua's gestured his finger. She gently pushed the plate toward him. Dong Hua paused, she continued to push the plate with her stomach. Dong Hua tapped his finger on her sauce-stained nose and looked at her for half a day. You, still want more? There's nothing left today. I'll make some for you tomorrow. She looked at him numbly, blinked then suddenly tugged his finger to dip into the sauce. He finally understood what she meant. That's all right. I've already tasted it. He frowned, it was dreadful. Looking at her, he continued, but since we are of different species, I thought our tastes would be different so I brought it to you to try. Then he concluded, I was right. Foxes have such different tastes. Feng Ju was dumbfounded. She gave out a cry and fell over on the crystal table. Dong Hua worriedly asked, Do you want to have it that much? Then he left and before she knew it, another plate appeared in front of her face. This plate was twice as large as the previous one, on it was two plump fish lying neatly side by side. Feng Ju widened her eyes at the plate, gave a cry, crawled up, gave another cry, and rolled over again. From then on Dong Hua considerately brought to her the same plump carp every morning, and the horrid taste was always preserved, as hard as quality control was. Feng Ju thought to herself Dong Hua was a god with unpredictable emotions. If she didn't eat the fish, he might keep it in his heart and become melancholic over time. But continuing to consume this stuff wasn't a good solution. Dong Hua had really misunderstood her this time. Then came one day when Granny Taishan made a visit. Coincidentally she also had a pet snow fox. Feng Ju slyly gave the snow fox half of her fish portion right in front of Dong Hua. The little snow fox cautiously tasted it then suddenly stretched its neck to cry out. Its paws desperately scratched at its throat. At last it accidentally swallowed the fish and had to strain to vomit everything back out. Feng Ju sympathetically watched the snow fox dash around the courtyard looking for water to wash down its intestines. She blinked her eyes toward Dong Hua as if to say, we foxes have very normal tastes. I swallowed everything each day just for you. Her implication was strong. Adding more tea, Dong Hua held the teapot looking at her thoughtfully and finally understood. Hey, so among the foxes, your taste is still unique. Feng Ju raised her paws to her chest, staggered back two steps, and fell to the ground in despair. Several more days quickly passed by. Feng Ju's red fur started to shed in clumps from Dong Hua's cooking talent. Waiting for him to realize on his own would be impractical. She needed to find a way to save herself. After much thought, she decided there was no other way besides telling him directly. She had thought beforehand that she could relay her feelings through body language. Today she would gather her courage and decline Dong Hua's plump carp. When she walked by his study, 
she overheard Lord Lien Song chatting to Dung Hua, some of it was about her. She didn't mean to eavesdrop, but there were limitations that came with being a fox. Such as not being able to cover her ears. Before she could raise her front limbs to her head, several words have floated into her ears. First, it was Lien Sung's voice. I didn't know you like to keep pets. I noticed you have a fox now. Then, it was Dung Hua's voice. It's very special. You can say we're bound by fate. It was now Lien Song's voice again. You're lying to me. It's not as though I haven't seen prettier foxes. Look at the Bai family from King Kaiu, they're all unparalleled in looks. What's so special about your little red fox? It thinks my sweet and sour fish tastes good. Lien Song stammered, it is special, indeed. The conversation stopped here. Outside the doors, Feng Ju sadly looked at the clumps of fur on her paws. It was a bittersweet feeling. Even though things weren't how she had thought they would be, and Dong Hua was completely unaware of her feelings, it seemed he found her endearing because she had praised him for his cooking. Then if she came in right now to tell him everything was a lie, she shuddered at the thought. Whatever the case may be, this was still a beautiful lie. It was best to let it stay beautiful. Her fur might all shed away but she might as well view it as an early molting season. Who could have guessed with this much insistence to stay, she still departed Jokongtian that night, disheartened. A cold gust of wind blew by, slightly sobering Fengju. Thirty thousand years were but a baby's age in King Kaiu. But Fengju had picked up quite a few life lessons during that time. For instance, one should only remember happy things, and let go of the unhappy ones. Honestly speaking, there had been more unhappy times at Taichin Palace than there had been happy ones. Being here had made her reminisce the things she kept inside. It could be seen that what she remembered were mostly good memories, so she should also cheer up. She took a few jumps onto the pavilion, wanting to try the crystal chair she had always wanted to sit on. But when she did sit on it, it wasn't as comfortable as she thought it would be. Dong Hua had often sat here to edit the Buddhist sutras sent to him from the far west. At such times, she had rested her head on his feet to watch the stars. The stars on heaven didn't have the dreaminess of the stars back home. Instead, they hung distantly at the end of the sky like unsold candies at the end of the day. There wasn't a whole lot to see, really. She only wanted to have an excuse to stay by Dong Hua's side a little longer. She knew well how her uncles had sweet-talked her aunts into marriage. When she could talk, she planned to follow their footsteps and coax Dong Hua to King Kaiu. At that time, she would tell him, Look at these cold stars, they're not at all lovable. I'll take you stargazing in King Kaiu one day. In the blink of an eye, a hundred years had passed by. Those clever words she wanted to say were never spoken. It was now midnight. From an unknown place came an array of celestial sounds. Half the sky was covered in the bright moonlight and all the stars converged at the Milky Way. She leaned on her palm and gazed to the cold moonbeam. She whispered as if to herself, I'll take you stargazing in King Kai one day. She woke from her thoughts. At first she was startled, then she shook her head and started to smile her words casually dispersed by the night wind beside the azure lily pond. In a blink, they had vanished, as if she was sitting there, and never once said a thing. The Yanfu branches cast shadows against the arching doorway. 
On the ground were scattered purple yanfu petals. Dong Hua languidly leaned against the moon-shaped door. He wore a sleeping robe of thin white silk. Loosely draped outside was another long coat. He originally followed her to the garden to see how she intended on leaving. At first, he thought she lost her way because she was in a hurry, but it turned out the brat was actually planning to dig up one of his plants. She was even enjoying the scenery here, her expression was momentarily happy, then momentarily sad, as if something was weighing on her mind. Dong Hua gazed up and saw the purple drowsiness diffusing outward from his bedchamber. Covering more than half of Taichan Palace by now, it resembled a stretch of lingering cloud as though it was an auspicious sign. He supposed the brat had used up all of her energy to cast these sleeping spells on him. From the southeast corner, it appeared that even the celestial sounds had also begun to die away in the purple smoke. The person who conjured up the spell seemed to be in complete unawareness. She looked to still be absorbed in thoughts. In a flash, the purple color had gradually spread into the garden. It diffused through the waterfall, reached over the high towering trees, and finally flowed into the sandalwood pavilion. Dong Hua silently counted to three and, in the moonlight, turned toward the immersed young lady. As predicted, she easily tipped over. Pushing aside the Yanfu branches, Dong Hua walked in from behind the arching doorway. Everything was quiet within the courtyard. Even the Bodhi vine's usual dim glow seemed to be much more subdued. Inside the pavilion, the ancient white sandalwood's fragrance had dwelled in one spot, seemingly unable to dissipate. He bent down to see her dozing away on the white crystal table and couldn't help but chuckle. How could she be cast under her own magic without knowing a thing? She was probably the only one in the entire world. Who could blame her father Bai Yi for doing everything he could to find her a capable husband? He lightly reached out toward her and conjured up a spell from his fingers. In the garden shrouded under a sleepy mist, he turned her into a handkerchief anew and leisurely placed her back within his chest. End of chapter 3